what, where, and uh, when are we? Uh, I don't know. You set the portal for Night City 2077, right? I mean, I thought so, but it's all chunky. Mmm, the future is here, and it's a chunky dystopia. Or, um, let's see, we're in cyberspace. (laughs) This is what cyberspace looks like. Are you sure? I don't know, it kind of looks like the inside of a Super Nintendo game. Welcome to Backlog Quest, where we hack through the cyberspace of our game libraries in search of interesting indies. My name is Boss Sauce. And I'm Rolling Coons, and together, we are the Two-Headed Hero. Today's Two-Headed Hero sidles up to a brand new cyberpunk game. No, not that cyberpunk game, this one. Yep, it's Disjunction, a stealth action RPG from debut developer Ape Tribe. Disjunction dropped onto all major platforms and consoles on January 28th, 2021. The game's 42 reviews on Steam are barely a fart in the wind, so we figured it's a prime candidate for Backlog Quest, despite the recent release date. I guess this is more like a... Front Log Quest? 2048 Following the arrest of a prominent community leader, New York stands in disarray. Wait, 2048? Ah, damn it, dude. Did you round down to save CPU cycles again? New York City? Uh, this voice recognition never works. Hey, 486. I said Night City. Night City. New York City confirmed. Disjunction slides its cyber deck firmly into the category of stealth action. As you probably know, stealth action games involve three components. Crawling around furniture, beating on unfortunate thugs that have bad peripheral vision, and stuffing bodies into broom closets. We've seen this theme time and again throughout the half-century history of video games, but how does Disjunction set itself apart? The ad copy claims big features like an adaptive storyline where player choices matter, three characters with distinct playstyles and tool sets, unlockable cyber toys, and gameplay consequences. All this in a game that looks like it belongs on the Super Nintendo? I'd love to believe it. Oh, why so cynical? Is the dystopian future getting to you? Oh man, I need one of those lamps. Disjunction opens with some heavy pixel aesthetics that would look right at home in 1994. Check out this cityscape. Now look, there's a cool train loading screen. The pixel art looks so stylish. The characters are easy to read, The tile sets emphasize murky browns, eerie greens, sickly yellows, and regal purples that really drive home the themes of each level. The art team really manages to get a lot of variance in the tile sets with just a smattering of broken tiles here and there. Uh, Really smart. Onto the sound. You'll be pleased to know that there, in fact, is some sound. Effects seem to be mostly limited to stock noises, but the ambient music matches the mood extremely well with wobbly synth weeds and drum machines. Though Disjunction is dialogue heavy, there's only a few characters and the game is short, which would seem to lend itself to some voiceover work. But, I suppose fully voiced conversations might also take away from the Super Nintendo era feel that the game is reaching for. Uh, you can't have it all, I guess. Since the game is billed as a stealth action RPG, let's start with the component every RPG needs, a story. Most of the exposition takes place in familiar looking dialogue screens or newscasts, but these little orange text sections provide the option for deeper knowledge about 2048 New York while keeping awkward info dumping to a minimum. I like this feature a lot. More games should have it. As for how much the choices matter, uh, some of the event dialogue changes depending on how murdery you decide to get, but the broad strokes of the game remain the same when trying out different options on a new playthrough. There's a few different end dialogues, but the meat of the game plays out the same levels in the same order. No consequences to your dialogue or gameplay style seem to change this. There's also only one save slot, so trying other plot branches means that you have to replay the entire game. 
Come on, guys, not even a chapter select, throw us a bone here. The plot itself is a grab bag of tropes all mixed up and drawn from a hat. There's a drug named Shard taken over the streets, and a prominent community leader is arrested and accused of distribution. Was he framed? Who could have done it? The Russian mob? The Chinese triads? Was it the cops themselves? Is the big scary corporation behind it all? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> yeah, almost certainly. It seems like an awful lot of the objectives revolve around hacking into, talking on, or stealing terminals, which is the game's really retro-futuristic code word for smartphone. Kind of weird that apparently everyone's phone lives at their desk. And here I thought this was the future. You know what? Maybe it is the future and society has kind of like come back around on the whole keeping a tiny computer in your pocket at all times. Maybe they're like having some healthy distance from all their screen time, you know? Okay, but then how do you explain like just putting the screen time inside your own body? <laughs> well, there goes my thesis. Even with the cliches, or maybe because of them, the storyline is like a warm, fuzzy blanket of 90s nostalgia that takes us back to the days when everyone just wanted a cool robot hand and an edgy haircut and a laser eye and another laser eye but on their friend. And Paranoid Conspiracy was a fun exercise in imagination and not just another part of the daily 24-hour news cycle. The delivery is a compliment to Disjunction's awesome pixel aesthetic. It's moody enough to make it work in the game's favor, and easy enough to skim for those that want to get into the action. Suspicions and allegations run rife throughout the city, as an insidious drug known as Shard spreads throughout the underworld. With the city's future in doubt, three hardened citizens rise to discover the truth and uncover a conspiracy threatening to alter the city's fate. Uh, who keeps saying that? Well, whoever it is, they're not wrong. Disjunction features three distinct characters. Each with their own story. Each with their own special abilities. Each one, a different trope. First, we have Frank, the hard-boiled private detective trope. Frank's got glowy cyber eyeballs, presumably to help him with detecting. His abilities complement sneaking and include a first aid kit, a ninja smoke bomb, a taser, and impeccable aim. And he's also armed with a big honking revolver. Then we have Joe, the disfigured cyborg ex-military guy who's out for revenge trope. Joe's nickname is Lockjaw, and it's unclear if that's a reference to his clanky robot jaw or if his robot parts gave him tetanus. You gotta, you gotta get the stainless steel robot parts. Surgical steel is probably for the best. Joe has a loadout for punching, including special features like punch faster, take more punches, throw a punch bomb, own a shotgun, and do a steroid. <laughs> Rounding out the three, we have Spider, the grumpy former mob princess turned hacker with daddy issues trope. She's the one with the Bluetooth stapled to her head. Spider's kit is stacked for subtlety and includes such hits as a stun grenade, a submachine gun, and a rechargeable battery to power her adorable kitty hologram. What's conspicuously missing is her complete inability to hack any of the multitude of robots, drones, turrets, and cameras that are liberally sprinkled throughout Disjunction's killing floors. Well, that's got to be really frustrating for her. Yeah, it really adds another dimension to her character. Like, I'd be an angsty ex-mob princess with daddy issues too if I could not do the one thing that I tried to do in life, despite my fancy head Bluetooth. If I went to online college to get a hacking degree, and then it turns out that all of the robots are hardwired or whatever, all I'm saying is in the future we need to make sure that all of our robots are Bluetooth compatible. Yeah, I mean, think about the hackers. Their egos are at stake here. The majority of Disjunction involves tightly crafted levels with multiple paths. Your cyborg crew chooses to traverse these with either a leisurely jog or the video game's standard crouch, the latter of which shows enemy vision cones. Most of the interactivity is limited to finding keys and doors, but exploration can pay off with resource caches, minor world building, or upgrades for your abilities. 
The ability tweaks from these upgrades aren't major, green smoke bomb and grey smoke bomb function pretty much the same, but each character can respec between levels so you also aren't married to your choices. The RPG mechanics seem like an afterthought, but still provide some welcome variety. Do you think the smoke bombs smell differently? They definitely do. One's tear gas, apparently. So that one is spicy smoke bomb, and the other one is uh, bland smoke bomb. <laughs> or maybe it's like one is full flavor and one's menthol. Yeah, or like cedar and chili banana. <laughs> or like um, patchouli and mace. Wait, that's tear gas. <laughs> patchouli and tear gas. <laughs> The tear gas one smells just like tear gas. Weird. It tastes like tear gas, too. Why do I keep eating these? Strategies evolve slightly depending on what character the game sticks you with for a given mission. If you're going for a no-kill stealth run, you'll basically end up with one of three different flavors of sneaking and punching, with some fun special moves thrown in for fun. Yeah, some fun ones thrown in for fun. <laughs> For fun. I wrote this at 5 in the morning. For fun. <laughs> <laughs> For fun. If you're playing Dysfunction... Dysfunction, more like. Get it? Oh, I get it. If you're playing Dysfunction, primarily as a shooter... Well... Well... Let's just say I wish you luck. Your reaction times will be tested to the limit. Enemies are your usual bevy of beefy cyborgs and gun thugs, and the somewhat deaf and blind AI is compensated by quick enemy reaction times and just the sheer number of goons that line up to gang beat your unlucky cyborgs. Your trio of titanium troublemakers are all surprisingly fragile, so whether you're punching or you're shooting, your reflexes and your quick thinking will need to be on point. Unfortunately, it seems that the fast reaction times are duct taped to cover some pretty big holes in the enemy placement and AI. Some guards are placed facing walls or key cards. My job is just to look at this here key card all day long. Well, shift's just about over. <laughs> Guards are pretty much deaf, only hearing your cyborgs creep up when you're within inches. Sometimes you can catch them standing just outside of an active alarm and ignoring it. Hear that? Hear what, the alarm? Eh, not my jurisdiction. What time is wrestling on, anyway? The AI often won't even notice if a co-worker gets their teeth knocked out right next to them, or a robot explodes down the hallway. However, they will come out all guns a if a stray bullet plonks anywhere nearby on the same city block. They are also very distractible when it comes to kitty holograms. No! Look at his little paws! On the other hand, some guards will take pretty complex routes through multiple rooms. Some of the mechanical enemies have involved vision cones, which can make sneaking up behind them a challenge and gives the stealth way more variety than just sneak up behind and tap punch. During these rousing rounds of pillar tag, bodies can be hidden away or left out as decoys, and even the sound of your gun can be used to draw out a guard from their post. Learning to prioritize your targets and choose the right tools for the most efficient takedowns goes a long way towards keeping your clanky characters copacetic. I wonder if in the future, two Bluetooth earpieces at once? Well, I mean, okay, you need three, really. You need one that goes directly into head, and then one for each ear. Oh, I thought the third one went in your mouth. I mean, it's a butt plug. I mean, you could put it in your mouth, but... Oh, okay, there's no Bluetooth. There's no Bluetooth. It's just a butt plug. Anyway... But really, does any of this matter when you can have extreme cool factor moments like these? Solid snaking your way through disjunction is also super tense due to the save system. Many floors only have one mid-level checkpoint, and the player decides when to activate it, 
which adds a risk-reward element, but can also lead to some frustrating repetition. As mentioned before, time to kill is low, but the game gets you back in the action instantly after every brutal death. This gives Disjunction a taste of that coveted one more try gameplay, and is probably why several reviews liken it to a cyberpunk version of Hotline Miami. More like Hot Bar Miami, am I right? More like Botline Miami, because of all the robots. When the chips hit the fan, it's really satisfying to pull off a daring escape with a well-timed smoke bomb or a flurry of punches. Since the dynamics of each encounter play out based on split-second timing and pixel-perfect positioning, Disjunction actually can claim that no two runs will turn out exactly alike. For example, here we have the same scenario. The first one is a quiet approach. Now check out what it looks like going loud. Beginning conclusion now. Conclusion mode activate. Throughout my time with Disjunction, I couldn't help but think about Shadowrun for the SNES. While that game was flawed, I still see it through the rosiest of colored glasses because of what it did right, an unparalleled sense of atmosphere. Shadowrun was a corroded, dystopic, pixelated romp through a stylish setting, and the storyline's visuals and design choices are the junctions where Disjunction and Shadowrun meet. Maybe it's a little less Blade Runner and a little more Johnny Mnemonic, but despite its flaws, Disjunction achieves its function. Oh god. Disjunction Junction, what's your function? Hack it up words and cyberpunk butt plugs. <laughs> <laughs> but despite its flaws, Disjunction achieves its function of providing a tense, action packed romp through a grimy, chrome plated underworld. The stealth will clench your gut cheeks, and the shooting will temper your trigger finger. And really, what more could we ask for than some good old-fashioned, nostalgic retrofuturism? 